Hi, friends, and welcome to the Poppin' Past 40 interviews. I'm so excited today. My whole soul was like exploding today um, and yesterday. So uh, I have with me today on audio um, Dr. Sammy David, who literally changed my life. That's all I can say. Um, this is his book. And you'll notice the cover is completely gone because I have lent it to so many clients and, and friends. Um, but he wrote this book called Making Babies. And it is, I think, in, in my opinion, the best collection of what to do um, if you want to conceive in, in, in um, an easier effort, like kind of like less efforting. Um, and so uh, let me just introduce Dr. Sammy David. Um, most of Dr. Sammy David's patients come to his, come to him and his office as a last resort after being told, after spending a fortune on IVF treatments, that they will never have a baby on their own. Uh, he's brought thousands, he's helped women bring thousands of babies into the world uh, with his assistance. Dr. David is known as a medical detective, and I can attest to that. It's really incredible the work that he does. Um, he spends hours reviewing medical records from fertility doctors from all around the world, investigating what may have been missed before the patient even walks in the door. He meticulously lays out an individualized treatment plan for each patient. Oftentimes, he finds that the woman is blamed, the woman is blamed after being bombarded with IVF drugs in repeated highly cost cycles, when in fact, it is actually a problem that, that is overlooked by the male factor that was the issue. Dr. David works in parallel with a specialist in male fertility, an internationally known specialist, the renowned Dr. Mark Goldstein. Dr. David was one of the original believers in and supporters of integrated medicine, creating Fifth Avenue Fertility. Uh, a certified acu with certified acupuncturist and nutritionist, the superb Angela Lee. Dr. David is expanding his famous practice of non-IVF treatment plans to include national and international patients via Skype and phone consultations. Um, his enormous history of success includes patients who have fa failed multiple IVF cycles, have had recurrent miscarriage, women in their 40s, women who've been told that their FSH and AMH is abnormal and they need an egg donor for IVF, which is kind of my experience with, um, with Dr. David. Um, as many of you know, I've been to four of New York best doctors. They all told me I, I would never have a baby with my own egg. I tried uh, two IVF cycles that failed and I was devastated, desperate, and that's when I found uh, Dr. Sammy David, who basically ran a few simple tests, and within, I think it was four cycles, Dr. David? I think- I don't remember, <laughs> sorry, Four Donna. cycles, and we, we got pregnant, healthy, happy baby. Um, okay, so I'm just reading, this is from your website, Dr. David, so this is your, um, this is your intro from your website. Uh, he was recently named by Vitals among the top 1% of doctors in the country for patient care. And that is so true. Um, there, I've never experienced a doctor who has been so loving and so supportive as Dr. David. Um, and that was out of 870,000 doctors uh, for bedside manner, doctor patient face to face time, and uh, a degree of follow up. His pre prestigious degrees include. Columbia College undergraduate, Columbia Medical School, New York Hospital, Cornell Medical Center for Internship and Residency, and a fellowship in infertility and reproductive endocrinology at the University of Pennsylvania. In keeping with his philosophy that a baby's environment begins before conception, everything in Dr. David's office is non-toxic, um, organic and fully green. You know, Dr. David, I knew you were the doctor for me when I walked in your office and you had Mountain Valley spring water and glass bottles. So, <laughs> That's, thank my wife for that. She, she was the uh, founder of Green Seal and Amazing. an environmentalist before Al Gore ever, third of, ever thought of it. 
Amazing, amazing. I'm I'm so I'm so blessed and grateful to have you with me today. I, I know you're very busy. So thank you so much for joining me. I love you. And I could say that very easily. I just adore you. There there are not enough superlatives to um thank you. to glorify. But there there are a lot of things that I think I'd like to bring out and people should be aware of and I think should spread the word because I I agree with you. I think the IVF um family, the IVF doctors, tend to take the easy way out and blame the victim. And uh, well, let, let's, anyway, let's continue on and let's, let's talk, go ahead. Okay, so I know that there's this article that you're very interested in talking about, about the um, anti-malarian hormone, which is AMH, which is uh, what we hear all the time and the, on the boards and everything. Um, and it's an article that uh, is by Leah Brezel and um, its AMH is a predictor of reproductive potential. So please talk about that. Oh, please. This is exactly the most important part of this interview, please. All right. It was published in a rather, not obscure, but rather under the, under the gun, uh, un, under the uh, radar uh, journal called Current Opinions Endocrinology, Diabetes, and Obesity not the typical journal Fertility, Sterility, or American Journal of OBGYN. Again, uh, as, as uh, Donna said, the title is Anti-Malarian Hormones as a Predictor of Reproductive Potential. I, have to, I actually called up the doc when I saw this article. It was appearing in December of this past year, so it's only been out for four months. And it sort of proves that the use of the AMH should not be as a filter for who could get, who will get pregnant, who will not get pregnant. It was involving 1,200 women, and they compared their pregnancy cycles over 12 cycles, those with high MH and those uh, with low AMHs. And, and the conclusion was this, although AMH is a marker of ovarian reserve, existing literature does not support the use of AMH as a marker of reproductive potential in the general population. Wow. Meaning taking 1,200 women, their success rates, whether they had a low MH or, or high MH, was the same. One, one caveat, assuming they're not going to do in vitro. My objection to the IVF doctors, and I know they don't like me, is that <laughs> they use this as, as a filter as to who gets in and who doesn't get in, as yes. though they have a a special society you can join only if your AMH is above 1.5 or whatever their, their cutoff points are. They don't look at a woman as a complete entity. Uh, lifestyle, nutrition, um, stress factors, aside from just hormones, you know, th they have other issues that will imp imp uh, imp impact on their fertility. Yes, and that's where uh, that's where I have my greatest objection to the IVFs. Uh, they one test fits all, and if you're 36 or 46, it doesn't matter. Um, if your AMH is low, you cannot get pregnant. And how dare they make that assumption? It really is. And, and they say, oh, well, did a complete workup. Their workup involves basically a histogram that tells you you've got a uterus, a sonogram that says you've got some ovaries and eggs. And a husband who has whether he, whether good sperm or bad sperm, it doesn't matter. He has sperm, and it's your fault, not the husband's fault. Doctor, so Doctor David, the, yes. yes. It's. A, I was saying it's a vindicate, vindication for what I've been saying to everybody all along, and it's almost a mantra, which is, age is the diagnosis of exclusion. So you can't say age is the cause of their infertility until you have looked at everything, including husband, environment, infections. I'm sorry, Donna, go ahead. Well, I was going to say a perfect example of um, where they're always blaming the woman. I remember I sat in your office and you were talking about a woman who had done about nine cycles and she was really at her wit's end, came to you, and you were the first doctor who said, let's do a very specific uh, sperm analysis looking for bacteria on the husband. And you found that he had E. coli in the sperm. And then after that, she went on to have like three babies or something like that with little or no intervention. 
And like All that right. just blew me away. Yeah, this, this, a couple actually flew in from San Francisco and they've been told after nine IVFs at age 40, 41, I don't remember if she was, but oh, it's your quality of your eggs, you need donor egg IVF. And thankfully they didn't accept that. So here they came in and I worked them up for failed in vitro and just for general infertility. In, in and the husband did have E. coli and after penicillin therapy, which is cheap, she had has two kids, not three kids, two okay. boys, all right? But the most, one of the more important or most important cases I can remember is a woman who did 10 in vitro successes, 10 in vitro trials with the two best programs in the city. All right, she just sent me a Christmas card showing her two boys. All right, so I'm looking at the chart and say, did anyone tell you that your husband's sperm shapes are abnormal? She said, no, they just go ahead and you know keep doing IPF for 10 times. Well, I sent, I had him evaluated by a male specialist, Dr. Dr. Goldstein, and he has varicoceles, and he had low progesterone, mm -hmm. low testosterone, I'm sorry. So sur surgery is done on his varicoceles, we give him Clomid, not the wife Clomid, and she has her first son, like at age 40, 41. No IVF. Then, no IVF. No IVF. No IVF. No IVF. Yeah. And then um, she gets pregnant again, maybe 42, 43, and has a miscarriage, and 43 has her second son. So three pregnancies within a period of maybe three years, only by looking after the husband's sperm quality. And I just had an experience with some a doctor uh, who was refusing coverage for one of my patients I wanted to do IUIs on in inseminations. He said, oh, but the literature shows that postcortal tests are not important, and uh, that's exam after intercourse, and sperm shapes are not important. But meanwhile, I'm sure he does IPF, and he does inseminations without any uh, call at all. So shapes of sperm are important. I think the post call test is important. And Donna, I thought you were going to come here for the interview, but I had two charts for you to look at both mm. in the past month, a patient from, from California and a patient from Texas, both of whom became pregnant on just cough medicine. Now, they're not the over 40 crowd that I usually have, but one had already been trying for eight years, for two years, and one for about one year. And in both cases, they said their doctor doesn't believe in the postcoital exam. Well, I do. And using well, I remember, measure. I remember the postcoital exam because you asked me to come over to the microscope and you said, "What's happening?" And I said, the, "Nothing's happening." And you said, "Exactly, the sperm are dead. Your body is killing the sperm." And I was reading in your book um, about the cough medicine and about the um, the the um it, the cervical mucus and i was just blown away it, you know like people just don't don't um give cervical mucus the respect that it needs and you're telling me someone went on to have children just from changing the cervical mucus and it's like this you know the the ivf doctors are not checking for they don't care about that because they're doing something out of the body they don't care you know well, they, they don't care they, about they the, have well, it's like, it's like a or orchestra or a band that only has one tune. They all march the same tune. They all have their own guidebook, which is three months of Clomid, IUIs, and in vitro. They don't really care about the husband very much, which is a, a shame because the morphology, shapes, and function of the sperm are of critical importance. Instead, the woman gets blamed. It's your egg quality or, or you know, your your IMH is low and so on. That's why you're not getting pregnant. Right. I want. I would like to see them put to task and say, "Oh, give a diagnosis to the patient. Don't just don't give Clomid and IUI and then I'm in vitro, which is their usual playbook. Give and a there's, diagnosis. There's no one else doing what you do. I don't think. It, which which is such a concern. I mean, are there any? Do you know of anyone else doing the kind of work that you're doing? I don't think there is anyone else anywhere in the world. There, uh, I, please, I'm sure there is, but I don't know that, I don't know. Um, I'll tell I mean, you I'm where just worried, I like, I'm just worried when, you know, like, when I who's retire gonna or carry, who's going to carry the torch? <laughs> who's going to carry the torch? Nobody. The, well. Nobody, because the IVF doctors make more money, okay? Mm. Um, about a year or two ago, I was seeing if I could somehow transition into a 
semi-retired state, and, and that's impossible. And the people in Stanford University in California said the following to my representative. They said, this is very good medicine, but we don't want it because our IPF team makes millions and millions of dollars for the university. Disgusting. So that's where you're coming from. Disgusting. And if they tell you you're too old, they can still have an idea. We'll, we'll sell you this new product called Donor Egg IVF. Right. And by the way, about you know, I, I wasn't sure how to approach this. And I, let me say this so, what I, so I don't get sued by all the IVF teams and fertility uh, doctors. But this is my opinion. They don't give enough. Why are they suggesting donor eggs to patients? And maybe I have a couple from out of state who became pregnant with donor sperm. Basically, what I said to her is, here you are, you're 44 years old. They'll be telling you donor eggs and your husband's sperm is not very good. So why don't we try donor sperm? And guess mm -hmm. what? At age 45, she has a baby. Gorgeous. I love that. I absolutely love It was a male factor all along. So you have to give, understand, primary infertility is 40% Sorry, I don't know. 40% male, 40% female, and 20% sort of a co combination. Mm. So why are they looking at you and say, oh, you're 41, 42, your AMH is this, and it's obviously your problem. It's not so obvious to me. It's obvious to a person who wants to sell you a product, which is right. IVF. And I know, I know firsthand because when we started our time with you, um, you had suggested that John do some acupuncture and you know change a few things and and we were very diligent about the electronic devices we were very diligent about you know lowering the coffee he went to dr wu a few times he started on some herbs and supplements the diet was always good because i'm a health coach and i'm his wife and i've been on a fertility diet you know and i helped him with a little bit with that but i think within two months uh, when he went for his follow-up sperm analysis, I think it was like in the millions. And I mean, it just changed so much. The morphology, the motility, everything changed. And it was so empowering. You know, it was so empowering to us that we could do something and affect change in our bodies. And, and you know, we, I felt like we were being good parents before we even conceived. Because that's what parenting is. Taking care of things for yourself and for your, you know, the baby. And um, see, this and this is what Angela Lee does. That is, she'll she'll take the patient and you know try to do stress relief uh, and as well as very importantly nutrition, and yeah. we'll use uh, Chinese herbs if, as necessary. But so of course, perfect. it's a team approach. And when I was reading in your book about um, all of the different crazy male infertility things, like you know the how the varicoceles how it's like literally kind of cooking the sperm and like that's a problem no one even checks the guys and also about trauma to the scrotum no one's talking about trauma to the scrotum like a lot of these guys are athletic you never know they could have had a problem in high school that affected them nobody's checking anything so i just love that you're doing that detective work um okay so let me just go to some of my questions. I haven't even started my questions yet because I'm so amazed and it's just, you're amazing. Okay. So your biggest, the biggest misconception about trying to conceive over, over 40 is what is that? The biggest misconception. The doctors think that the woman has old eggs and, and they sort of convince her, oh, it is your age. See, my comment is about that is the, the same things that cause infertility in a 40 or 41 or 42 year old are the same things that cause infertility in a 21, 22, 25 year old. So don't look at the age, don't be, be uh, don't have your gaze taken away from the fact that you need, as a doctor, you need to evaluate her like any other patient. Right. If you remember, um, Julia Ndutrova wrote her, her, her book, inconceivable that was 20 year, 20 years ago mm. and it describes how she goes from doctor to doctor to doctor and they all say what's well, your age it's your age you're making a, a decision already based on your birth date or on your AMH right and I don't know of any other field of medicine that is coming to conclusions like that without doing a proper workup Right. I mean, the minute I walked in, I, I, uh, to the other doctors, they, nobody did an exam on me. They literally sat me down. 
looked at my age and then showed me a chart and, and said, okay, this is your chance. 5%, less than 5% each month at 42, 41. Um, it's crazy. So I, I just want to talk about something interesting that I read um, about a, a tribe, an a American Indian tribe in New Mexico who are known for their fertility. I forget the name of the tribe. I'll, I'll, I'll get that information to you. But they are known for having uh, pregnancies into their 50s and 60s. And when someone asked them, well, why do you think this is? And they, they said, well, no one told us we can't. <laughs> that's, a wonderful, that's a wonderful story. That is great. So I Listen. think there's a mind-body connection that is so big and so huge uh, that very little people are tapping into. And I know that, that you tap into that. You, know? you were the first person that really said, no, you could do this. I believe in you. And even just you saying that to me... Um, was a whole different thing. You know, I, I've I had conversations with clients and they, they say, when I walk into one of these IVF doctors, uh, the first thing they do when we're doing a cycle is they say, don't get your hopes up. Uh, the chances are very, it's probably not going to happen. Don't get your hopes up. And it's like, no, 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 you should get your hopes up. That you should plan as if that baby's coming, like, you know, in your body and your bones, that baby's coming, you know? Um, you have to have a, approach. I mean, you don't want to see a doctor for any of your medical problems and who, who's, you know, uh, doom and gloom. Oh, it's, it's not going to happen. We're just wasting our time. Here's a, you know, here's a new cottage industry called donor egg IVF. Right. So uh, un crazy. It's un it's un they're not, they have to have a positive approach. So why the, uh, go on, yeah. ask. Go okay. On. So, um, What's the clinical definition of infertility? It, it depends on the age group, if you want to. Uh, supposedly, if you're under like 30 or so, not able to conceive a pregnancy, either a pregnancy that miscarries or term pregnancy within a year. If you're like age 35, it, that goes, cuts down to six months. And then anything like after age 38, I think it's a good idea after even four months of trying. To, to get checked. Be, to get be evaluated. Point. Right, right, right. Okay. Um, why do you think fertility doctors put so much stock in statistics? And what do all those awful statistics mean to women over 40 who are trying to conceive? I don't, it's interesting you ask me that. I don't understand why they throw out statistics because this is only, or most of the articles are about patients trying to get pregnant in IVF. So you have to understand that each of these articles should end up if you do in vitro. I don't think there's been any uh, linear uh, studies like this woman, doc, Dr. Bresner at the University of uh, North Carolina. She, I, I commended her. I actually picked up the phone about a week ago when I saw the article. I said, congratulations on this, uh, this breakthrough because it really dis, uh, dispels the myth Oh, we have a way of knowing your fertility, and they don't. Damn it! You know they really don't. One of the so if I can there's there is one one miracle pregnancy I'd say I was responsible for, and that was a person in upstate New York who had chemotherapy for Hodgkin's disease, and her she, her FSH swung in and out of menopause. And every doctor at this medical center in upstate New York said it'll never happen. Well, it did. Why? Because I'm looking for something they didn't look for. In this case, the couple gets pregnant when she comes out of menopause after getting rid of the husband's bacteria. Mm. Well, they had a I little mean... point. With, with FSH levels up and down near menopause, you, you know what, what these FSH levels should be? Yes. She was ranging as high as 70 and 80. Wow. FSH. Wow. Not just the 20 to 25 unit FSH. This is big time. And so, so FSH is, is really just the, the amount of stress it, it causes the body to make the egg. It doesn't even talk to the quality of the egg. It's just like how much stress is it for the body to push, get to get to make egg. it. Yeah, to make the egg. Yeah. She was she wasn't ovulating maybe three or four times a year. But right. getting rid of the obstacle, which in this case was the bacteria in the husband's sperm, when she did ovulate, she actually got pregnant with a healthy embryo. Amazing. Healthy baby. Amazing. Boy. Um 
Hey, Don, it's not amazing. It's doc, doctors have to approach something with the, the with the emphasis and the hope of succeeding, not with already a preordained failure. No, nothing's preordained. Right. And I think a lot of it is just that uh, that they're racking up these cycles and knowing that it's a lot of money for them, and it's unfortunate. Um, okay, so I'm I'm moving on to my next question, which is um, getting pregnant as close to nature intended using uh, ARTs as necessary is really the foundation of what you do. Having patients and self-love, love for your partner, love for your baby trying to come through. And yet most doctors take out the big guns from the start. Why do they do this? And how could it make matters worse? I mean, I think we covered this a little bit. It, it ends up being a money thing. Um, but how could um, uh, IVF trial uh, cycles actually make it worse in the long run for a woman? Simply because usually, they, as you say, they come out with the big guns. And giving a person, say, the same dose of fertility drugs, whether it's gonalef, folosim, or menopure, giving them all the same dose and convincing them, oh, you're going to get the maximum dose we have. Maybe maximum is not what you really need. You right. maybe don't want 25 eggs that have been cooked, rather than you want maybe 10 eggs that are better quality. Right. Um, so, so again, they're, they're maybe sell, selling their product. I can give you huge doses of, of drugs and you're going to make lots of eggs. What they don't know is whether these eggs are, this, are as good as eggs developed under lower stimulation or for that matter, natural. Right. I and mean, then, I, yeah. sorry. No, go ahead. No, I was going to say, and then like, uh, it, later in life, how does how do all how does all that medication affect the, the body going forward and the reproductive system? Because I know that like if if someone's been on uh, birth control for years and years and years, uh, all sorts of things can happen as they get older just from having that amount of hormones. So having like the equivalent of like a month's birth control in a day or whatever it is, I you would know better than I do, but having tons of medication and doing, you know, how does that affect the, the health of a woman going forward as they, as they age? I, I think there's been enough data and enough years of experience to say that very little, thank God, very little uh, negative effect on the patient. Okay, that's um, good. With, with doses of drugs that they use. Just to, and, and they don't go through menopause any sooner because they're using up the, drug, the eggs sooner. They're, they don't. Okay, but that's good. Is again, is the doctor somehow introducing a variable by having to use high doses of drugs, which may you know may work in a negative way? Right. Um, more, but basically, again, one of these adages: more is not better. Right. Too much of a good thing is not a good thing in this case. Correct. Yeah. Like um, your cocktail. Right. <laughs> Go on. Um, can you, in the book, you, you touch on your thoughts of, of multiples and, and how it's, it's more challenging for the woman to carry multiples. What are your thoughts on multiples? I try my best. I try my best to get only one, one baby per patient. Though I have had a, a couple of cases, on the average, uh, maybe one to two sets of twins a year. But thank God, never anything more than that. And I usually warn the woman that you do have two mature follicles or, or three mature follicles. That happened last month when a young woman was on fertility drugs, which not very high either, but she had three mature follicles. I told her and her husband not to have intercourse for fear of triplets. Mm. But you, you have to know what you're, what, what you're dealing with and you have to let the patient know there's a chance for twins or, or I try my best for one. Because it's harder on the on the mom, yeah. It's harder. Harder on the mom, but yeah. more importantly, also you want the baby to approach term or at least near term. So right. the twins may be, with luck, they'll be delivering maybe three or four weeks early. Or, but if you, when when you run the risk of twins and they could, premature deliveries, they're in the NICU, neonatal unit longer. No, I I prefer just one. 
If I can, right. this is what, this is why I'm saying, for example, these two people, one from Texas, the one from California, were both pregnant from just being told to use cough medicine. Um, that's as natural as you can be. All I'm doing is altering nature, the mucus being maybe too thick, making it thin, and just trying to restore their fertility, not making, not forcing it to happen. I love that. I just, I just love that. Like no one's talking about that except you. I just love it. I just, I feel like you just have all these fabulous secrets and tips. It's but you know what? It comes, it comes from you know. I, I did my fellowship the first year it was available in the United States. That was in 1976, and it's from a perspective from the days when we did a lot of surgery to re repair tubes and so on, to the days when I started thinking at. at about infertility as a medical condition, not just surgical and not hormonal, and into the days of IVF. And thank goodness there is IVF, but I'm also critical of saying maybe they, as you say, bring the big guns in too soon. Right. And what they do is simply say, oh my God, if you don't do it now, you're losing your aim, your eggs every month, you know, 5% right. a month. Don't scare them. Just go through a methodical evaluation, the detective work, which is which, which is so much fun. It's fun. It is fun. It, I mean, it's it's really incredible to figure it out. Um, okay, so when I came to see you after seeing four of the other highly recommended doctors, you did test uh, that none of them did. We found I had three of the silent infections. Um, you talk a lot about silence and silent infections in the book. Can you tell the readers and the watchers what, the, what most doctors miss and how those silent infections could be keeping you from having a healthy baby? Okay, a lot of the doctors, in the doctors have finally heard, finally heard about the infections called mycoplasma. What they haven't heard and is not so clear is that there are several serotypes of this mycoplasma. And the one that is most destructive to pregnancies, causing infertility and causing miscarriages, is something called urea plasma. Urea. Yeah, that's what I had. Okay. Yeah. Now, it's the urea plasma. It's one of the mycoplasmas. And I look at all the records from all these doctors from around the country, and some of them will, will have read about mycoplasma, mycoplasma hominis, but they don't seem to have been testing for urea plasma. And that's the secret. So two or three stories. One woman in New Jersey trying to get pregnant for 10 years. This is in my early years, like 1980 or so, 1979, has this urea plasma. I give her and her husband tetracycline and guess what? She's pregnant in about two to three months after 10 years of trying. Amazing. But then there's one lady who will take the uh, award of having probably the most possibly the most miscarriages of any of my patients, which is a lady in Westchester. Every month that she was ovulating, she had symptoms of pregnancy, which were breast tenderness, nipple tenderness, sometimes a change in smell, heightened sense of smell, metallic taste. I asked her that when I first met her. And she said, yeah, I get these every time I ovulate. So I said, okay, this time you're my patient, do a blood pregnancy test 11 days after ovulation. So she does, and she's on her way to California, Kennedy Airport, comes to the office, I draw her bloods. She arrives at Ella in California and calls up saying she got her period. I said, no, you didn't, you were pregnant, that's a miscarriage. Mm. Okay, try again. So this time I give her drugs, or then make her ovulate, give her progesterone after ovulation. And she's pregnant again, lo and behold, two out of two. This time she miscarries at about six weeks, seven weeks, because I gave her progesterone. So then I find this drug called, uh, this infection called urea plasma, and give them antibiotics. Both of them get rid of it, give her progesterone, and she has a baby girl. So that's three out of three. So I'm convinced she had miscarriages every month for six years. Right. And I had had a few chemical pregnancies and we went to that protocol where we were even suppressing the immune system and doing all this other stuff. Um, and, and I was amazed because when I had done my cycles of IVF, they gave me, uh, they gave me um, an antibiotic, but they never gave it to John. And the thing is, we were passing it back and forth. 
And absolutely, absolutely, so ridiculous. Yeah. So nobody's giving it to the men. So even if they just, you know, if they even thought, oh well, let's give it to the man too. That would help a lot more than just giving it to the woman because they're going to have sex and they're going to pass it back and forth. Wow, incredible, but Donna. They make a lot of money doing IVF. Why would they want right. to exactly. find something easy like bacteria to treat? Nine dollar they- antibiotic, ridiculous. Um, all right, so. Uh, Oh, okay. So in your book, you talk about how all many couples need is just a very detailed explanation of the female and male anatomy um, is exact, <laughs> you know, and how exactly to have sex to make a baby. I'm amazed at your deep explanation of fer- ser- fertile cervical mucus. Um, and can you please share uh, for us while, why the cervical mucus is so important and what are some great tips to achieving the ideal hospitable environment to create a baby? <laughs> That's a long question. Okay. Um, when the woman is passing urine, she should be aware, you know, aware of this mucus that they'll see after wiping themselves. All right. So you're looking for a clear, transparent mucus, something that will stretch and is sort of slippery between your fingers when you're noticing it. That indicates that you're in the fertile window. Now, some people may have only one day of clear mucus. Some would have five days of clear mucus. Regardless of how many, I try to stress to patients, the last day of your clear mucus is your most fertile day. Because the next day you wake up and it's not there means you ovulated. Mm. Progesterone stops the production of clear mucus. So, therefore, you could uh, take some of the stress out of having to keep temperature charts or ovulation predictor kits, just be aware of your body. That's going to tell you when you're most fertile or not. Try to keep yourself hydrated. That's one issue. And uh, if, if these patients in Texas and California were pregnant, if they'd had post exams, probably would have found out that their mucus was too thick. Mm. Listen, I'm, these doctors make more money doing IUIs than Advise, doing post cold tests or advising on cough medicine or baking soda douches or antibiotics. So I have to tell you, um, my my video of my fertility story has about 181,000 views now. And the question I get most often is, how do I do the baking soda douche? Can you please do a video of how to do the baking soda douche? And I always say, buy Dr. Sammy David's book. He explains everything. Um, I remember going into the office and, and uh, you had uh, the nurse practitioner come in and she explained everything to me on how to do it. And I did it religiously. I was really great at doing it. And, um, and why does that work? It does. Because, listen, you said, you said earlier, what's the, what's the role of the cervical mucus? Nowadays, they, doctors don't care. I still care for a couple of reasons. Mucus could have bacteria in it and bacteria decreases your chance of getting pregnant, and even, even decreases IVF success rates. Because as the catheter passes through your cervix to deposit the embryos into your uterus, that tip of the catheter may get infected. All right, let's go back and say, what about this cervical mucus? Cervical mucus helps keep the sperm alive for one or two or three days, if it's a good mucus. So you don't have to be timing into course exactly as the egg drops. And it also does something called capacitation, which is prepares the sperm heads to release their enzymes to penetrate the egg. So there's a reason why God or nature put the cervical mucus in there. So if it's defective, fix it. If by fixing it, she gets pregnant, you've done service to the patient right. without having to do IUIs or IVF. And so when, when John and I met you, we were using um, some sort of lubrication from... Uh, you know, just like a regular store, or whatever lubrication. Um, and then you said, no, 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 that will kill sperm. That will change your cervical mucus. You can only use this one brand called Pre-Seed. And then it was after changing that, that we got pregnant. I mean, it was, it's so amazing. The little things like lube, no one's talking about lube, you know, and it's like the littlest thing. And um, we use a very small amount because you advise us don't use a lot of it. You know, it's better if you have a lot of um, foreplay to get things going, connect with your partner, et cetera. Um, but it's, it's pretty amazing. Um, the point is it's important. And these young doctors uh, doing infertility 
have been growing up with only IVF. It's unfortunate. So they consider me the old doctor. Who does post-cortisol anymore? Well, I still do. And there are two patients this month pregnant, one from Texas, one from California, who prove the point that you, that you could get results with simpler methods. About, about lubricants, the, the one case that you remind me of is a woman who flew in all the way from Lima, Peru, to see me many, many years ago. And when I get to that question about, do you use a lubricant? They say, oh yes, we use a nice fragrant lubricant. We like the smell. So I, I sent them back to Lima. I said, don't use it. And they sent back a postcard two or three months later saying that they were pregnant. Oh, I just got chills. I love that. I love, I love the simplicity of that. I, it's beautiful. From Lima, Peru, just to be told, oh, you shouldn't be using lubricants. Right. Um, I, love, I love how in your book you stress the the importance of a warm uterus. I'm forever explaining to clients um, that they should not have cold drinks or cold salads. Um, they should keep that area cozy, wearing warm socks to bed, et cetera. Um, can you explain like a clinical reason for this? I, I know it's, um, it's more of the traditional Chinese medicine part. And, and also what fertility foods do you recommend? Oh my God, Donna, don't ask me that. This is, this is Angela Lee's field. All right, so, so maybe on. I'll talk uh, with Angela. Um, I think you should have a talk with her. I, I would curious. love to. I would absolutely on, love to. Do her yeah. on the Zoom. I think it's a great idea. I would love that. Um, so forgive okay. me, I can't answer the question, but I, I, these are important. Nutrition is important. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, talk, with, I'll talk with Angela. That's great. Um, I, I love that your office is focused on green living and you encourage patients to have a healthy organic lifestyle. Can you talk about the why technology is bad for sperm and eggs like cell phones um, and well cell phones if the man is carrying it in his pants may have some effect um so try to keep it somewhere else yeah ew i tell everybody about go on to ewg.org and a lot of people haven't even heard of it yet which is environmental working group and they're going to be telling you about everything that you touch in your life uh, and I tell people the skin is the largest object of the organ in yes. your body. Yes. So look at what soaps, detergents, sun, sunblock, uh, cosmetics, anything that might affect. If you can minimize the amount of toxins in your system, clearly it should improve your chance of them, not just having a baby, but having a healthy baby. Yes. I, I talk about that all the time. Like even the containers you put your food in and like your shower curtain that's plastic you could have been inhaling all of that and nobody's even thinking about that um see, this is where you you go on ewg.org and yeah. go through your house and see what you have and see if it's toxic or not toxic yeah try to change your lifestyle okay so i have a big question this is something that frankly confuses me um what is the m-t-h-e-r mutation M -T -H -E how do you test for it and what what is it and what is it what's the what is it i think it's getting a lot too much uh publicity methyl tetrahydrofolic acid reductase mthfr okay it's a, a genetic mutation in some of the proteins in your body that if this genetic mutation is there increases your chance of clots Clots increase the chance that you're going to clot off the placenta of the baby, and God forbid the baby dies at 15 weeks or 20 weeks or 25 weeks. If you speak to, to the traditional strict hematologist, it is a factor in strokes, heart attacks, and pregnancy loss. But the monitoring factor is also to check a protein called homocysteine in the woman's blood. So even if the person has an MTHR farm mutation, if the homocysteine levels remain normal, you're probably not at high risk. This is where I've been using low-dose aspirin and the folic acid preparation called L-methylfolate to try to lower the risk of increasing clots. So by that time, my patient's seeing her OB, but I send them with the caution that your OB doctor should monitor homocysteine levels I have everybody on low dose aspirin. Yeah, I remember being on low dose aspirin with you. I remember that. I, I remember that. Yeah. Getting too much publicity, MTHFR, that it could cause infertility. It does not cause infertility. 
it may, God forbid, cause a woman to lose a baby. Ugh. And that's where it is, becomes important. So it's definitely important to check that out too. Oh, without a second, of course it's important. I think everyone should have to check um, out. Can, can you talk about endometriosis and how that affects infertility? I, I know that it's so confusing to me personally and, and also to a lot of women out there. They're, you know, I see on, the, all, on all the chat groups, they have endo, they have endo. And how do you fix it and how does it affect it, fertility? Okay. Um, when I was at the University of Pennsylvania, I, I wrote an article uh, about that and staging of endometriosis. It's not a complete cause of infertility. It can cause infertility if it progresses. And when it progresses, if it causes scar tissue and causes the organs in your pelvis not to move by scar tissue, the ovaries, the tubes, and the uterus. So we, we did this article staging the endometriosis. And only in really severe cases does it cause infertility. Um, some people think it's an autoimmune dis disorder. Some people feel it, it secretes various uh, enzymes and cells in the pelvis that will stop uh, eggs from moving or sperm from moving. It is without a doubt a cause of infertility, but is it the only cause? And here too, I give people an example. When I had a woman who I knew had endometriosis, had an ovarian cyst, but, and I was trained to do the surgery, I didn't do it and I didn't want to do it uh, because she was telling me she, symptoms of pregnancy a couple of times a year or three or four times a year. So I, I thought she was having miscarriages, not infertility. So she goes down to my professor at Penn who, and twists my arm and decides you have to do the surgery. Your professor says you do the surgery. So I said, okay, fine, we'll schedule you. And then I come down with the flu. I have a high fever. I call her up from the days when you stop on the on the street and a cell and a coin operated telephone. Yes, payphone. Yeah. I say I have to cancel. I'm going to cancel your surgery. I have a high fever. And guess what? She screams in the telephone, and yells at me. You can't do this. You can't do this. I need this this removed. What do you think, Donna? I think she that was pregnant. Was she got pregnant. pregnant. Yeah. And then a second child, and I never operate on this which I knew was endometriosis. It, everything has to be put into perspective. Your first, my first 10 minutes of an intro is, am I dealing with infertility or pregnancy loss, implantation failure? Because it looks the same. The person gets their period on time. But are they getting pregnant and getting a period, a miscarriage on day 28? Or are they not getting pregnant? So it depends on, on the situation. Right. I remember when, when we were doing, when you were doing your detective work and our consultation, we, we figured out, I probably had about three chemical pregnancies that before I came to you, um, within Very that likely. year. Yeah. Um, so there was a whole thing. I, I just want to be aware of time. How much time do we have? I should be on my way, but go on 10 more minutes. please. Okay. Um, there's, there was that crazy article that came out in the, in the New York Magazine about um, uh, PGD uh, testing, the genetic testing. Oh, yeah. I, I, I didn't read it, but I heard about it. That's a tragedy. If that happens, if it's been happening, that's a tragedy. Yeah. To destroy, so it, to destroy yeah. embryos that are probably genetically healthy, but your geneticist says they're not. So people are, I know that when we did our cycles, we were really encouraged to do the PGD, which was about $5,000 just for the PGD. That's, that's why you were encouraged. Okay, yeah. but go on. <laughs> so, and they found through the PGD that basically nothing was viable. And then I read in this article, I think, I think Dr. Owen Davis might've been in that article actually. Um, uh, he loves you, by the way. He's one of the, you know, like you were saying, fertility doctors, don't, he loves you. Anyway, so um, I think it's something like uh, that they talk about the egg like a soccer ball and how the seams of the soccer ball are different from the pieces that they seam together. And if they take the, the, the one cell from the seam or, you know, like the different part of the egg, um, mm -hmm. how 
it could appear to be uh, chromosomal, but the fact is that in the first six weeks of pregnancy, um, there is an error correct mechanism in the egg, so it fixes some of those issues. Um, that's no, what... uh, you're totally right. But you know, this technology is helpful, okay, without a doubt. But in these borderline cases, and they're, what you have to say to the doctors are, okay, you're not sure, or maybe you're not sure. Go ahead, put the embryo in, and we'll do a, a biopsy of the embryo, like at 10 or 11 weeks, and confirm it is healthy or confirm it's not healthy. Right. I mean, you have time to make a decision and not carry the pregnancy if it's abnormal. So red flag, it might be abnormal. However, doctor, because you're not completely sure, put the embryo in, get me pregnant, and we'll test the biopsy uh, at 11 weeks. And there are some good doctors that are taking that leap of faith and saying, well, let's just, you know, I, kn I know that, um, that Owen Davis does not do PGD. So I, I, know. I know that that's his thing, that he's like, well, let's give it a chance. Let's let it error correct. And, um, and I think that so many women in their late 40s are getting those, um, the PGD and then having perfectly, you know, sort of borderline eggs thrown out when they could develop into perfectly healthy pregnancies. And it's a, sh it's a shame. Um, that would be the tragedy. That is, this technology has led us to, to perhaps hurt, pa hurt our patients. Right. And as they say, as doctors never cause any pain, never cause any hurt. Okay, so I do have some social media questions. Um, but what I'm wondering, is there anything that you really want to express? And I, I'm going to interview you again. I, I, I'm sure I, I'm very excited to do that. And I will talk to uh, Dr. I will talk to Angela Lee. But is there anything that I might have missed that you're uh, enthusiastic about sharing that you want to share? Or should I go just, on to, yeah. I, I just want the patients to understand that they have power. They should not just roll over and say, okay, I'm 42, that, therefore that's why I'm not getting pregnant. Don't you dare accept that from your doctor. Don't accept it from me. I mean, every woman who's ovulating has a chance like that lady with the cancer therapy, or a patient who was actually one of the, my New Yorkers on the West Side, uh, 47 years old, had about a, I think an eight or nine year old daughter at home. Every doctor, she, as she said, every doctor she saw, I'm 40, you're 47, it will never happen. She had her daughter at age 48. I love it. Don't. Don't look at the age. Don't look, and this is why I like about this article. Don't look at the AMH. Don't look at your day three FSH. Right. Say, okay, oh. doc, do do a good workup. Do a do good detective workup. What's going on? So, Ken, let's say uh, uh, someone can't get to you. I mean, they can get to you through Skype and and everything. Um, but let's say they, they don't have a lot of finances, whatever, and they're in a situation where they're like far away from you, what are some things that they can demand their doctor do or that they ask for? Well, one thing is I, I need to know more about the husband, understand they, they're, everyone's pointing to the woman in fertility, how about the husband? So I'd want to, all right, it's a very practical question what you ask. And I say, and I do have lots of patients from other states. Uh, I say, okay, then work with your doctor. This is what I need. I need a thyroid. I need a prolactin. I need him or her to do a postcortal test. And usually the doctor says, we don't do postcortal tests. I need them to culture your cervix for bacteria. I, and I send, send your husband's sperm FedEx it over here and we'll do the cultures here. And right. I just, uh, I laugh and I say, don't tell FedEx what's in it. Right. The bacteria will survive, but, but sperm won't. But I'm right. looking for bacteria. Right, right. Sometimes it's just empirically saying, hey, you know what? Take some cough medicine and see if it works. I love that. Or take some, oh, a, couple, a couple in Winnipeg, Canada, same thing. 10 years of trying to get pregnant. There was one, one note in the workup, the word inflammation. I said, you know what? You and your husband take Cipro. And what do you think? 10 years of trying, she gets pregnant in two months. Wow. So wow. Th there's a, if you're, if you're a doc, medical doctor, you've been through medical school, you have to look at everything. Lifestyle, anatomy, genetics, 
infections, hormones, and met metabolic issues, autoimmune issues, environmental issues. That's how you do a, a good workup. Not just that's, saying, okay, that's why you're free I, Yeah, go on. No, I was just going to say that's why no, I... No, no, not just saying you're 41, 42, 47, not because, oh, you had chemotherapy for, for can, cancer or whatever it is. What's Stop the oldest the, patient? What's the oldest patient you've had who's gotten pregnant with the littlest um, intervention? The oldest was that forty-seven. She had the baby at age forty-eight. But the woman who had the longest infertility that I was able to reverse, and she has a daughter, sixteen trying to get pregnant for sixteen years and three different husbands, and it turns out it was her, the woman who had antibodies to sperm, and nowadays. Laboratories don't, uh, IVF doctors don't bother to do sperm antibodies because they have an answer for that too. That's an IVF. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I know. And so, so the, the, that would be an immune system thing? That would be like something that you would do the prednisone for when they have the antibodies? Prednisone and IUIs, not just, right. doing the IUIs alone wouldn't bypass antibodies. It's right. Prednisone. Because I know with, with you, with, in my situation, we did the prednisone. I didn't like the way it felt. And then we did the soy drips, which I still don't understand yeah. why they worked, but they did because that was the cycle when we got Paloma, um, when we just did the soy drip. And you said, go have relations with John. And then we did the, and you do double, IV, uh, uh, double IUI. So we came in two days in a row, I think. Um, and I, is that right? We came in two yeah. days in a row. Yeah. And I sometimes just want to. Sometimes I do. I always sometimes one. Yeah. And I love that you have respect for the, you call it the B team, which is. Oh. Yeah. I love yeah, that. Yeah, I know. I just because love they, everything you do. And. The um, Barcy and the, and the JV. You're right. right. I love that. And, um, but I have to say the most powerful thing, I'm getting, I'm getting a little emotional. You know, I remember when we went to, um, to RMA and um, and we we were do we were in between IVF cycles and we were doing an IUI and we went in and John and I we pray all the time you know um, you met my husband you know we're we're hey, very spiritual wonderful. people and so we were doing we were in prayer and the doctor walked in it was like seven in the morning and she was changing her gloves and she opened up the trash can and there were like, must have been like 150, you know, insemination things, right? Like in the yes. trash. And, and we were praying and she looked at us and she rolled her eyes and she goes, this must be your first time. Like, oh. you know, just like, how dare you disrespect our connection to the divine creator? How dare you? And I remember when we did IUI, with you, you turned the lights down, you held our hands, we said a prayer. It was like so beautiful. I mean, you're, it's like creating an environment for a baby to come into the world is sacred. And the thing I love about you most is you have respect for that. And I just, I just wanna thank you for, for being you and just being, an, an amazing human being and not just a doctor. You're an amazing human being. But thank you also for sharing your, your story because I hope it will help others, whether they contact me or not, that's not the issue. The issue is you, and if I'm now talking to your, your audience, you have the power to tell your doctor, keep looking. You haven't found it yet, keep looking. Yes. And, and stop looking at my age, stop looking at FSH, stop looking at a AMHs. Just focus on why aren't I getting pregnant? Or doctor, do you think I'm getting pregnant having miscarriages? And that's what happened with you, what happened with, with, with uh, Julia and so on. People do get pregnant and they miscarry the day of their period and they're not educated and not told, hey, listen, look for it. Because if I, you can find it before you miscarry, I could save it. Yes. Oh, God bless you. And, and thank you so much for all the great bless work you do. And Paloma. <laughs> oh, thank you so much, doctor. Okay. And, and I look forward to talking more and I'll follow up uh, with the office about uh, Angela Lee. And again, um, this is the book, uh, Making Babies. Do I have it upside down. This is the book, Making Babies. Please buy it. It's, it's so special. Um, 
And, um, and Dr. David's at Fifth Avenue Fertility, and um, I'll have his information listed below. Um, thank you so much, Dr. David. I thank just, you, Donna. Thank you so much. Thank Come you. to the office, all right? I will. I will. I'm coming. Okay. Visit. All right. Okay. Love you. Right. I'll talk to you later. Bye. Bye. Bye.